people might be delaying up till after Kai and other things like that. Just before we start, I think Greg's got a few announcements. Can I can I take a minute of your time? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just about um, just about Ozkai. Some people will have Ozkai is the best conference in the world, and some people will have had this in an email today. But we desperately need a few people to do a few extra paper reviews, um, and I think just about everyone in the, in the room here would be qualified to do that. Um, it's probably about the best way there is to, to spend the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Review an Ozkai short paper uh, for people early in career. It's great. Practice and a good line to have on your CV to be reviewing for such an august conference. So, so when's the deadline to get the reviews back? I think it's probably drifted back to about the end of next week. I think it's negotiable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was Wednesday yeah. the 24th. Do, do I look desperate? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> um, Second request. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm working up a, a proposal for an, uh, a Kai workshop. We're trying to pull together some ideas about um, uh, health therapies, online mental health therapies, and well-being, and learning interpersonal um, skills and emotional stuff. And if anyone is, is operating in that space and would like to get on board with a, a reasonably mature proposal, please contact me, and uh, that will come together over the next few days. And I think that's everything. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Wendy. Wendy and I met in um, Vancouver at this. Um, yeah. It was on Martin's recommendation just before I left. He said, you must go and see Wendy. <laughs> so I was uh, dutifully went and listened to Wendy's talk. It was, a, it was a wonderful talk and I could see exactly why Martin was uh, was insisting that I go. And then I later found that Wendy's got connections with uh, Jenny's and others in, in the group. And there's a strong association between Wendy's work and the work that we're doing here. So I'm, we're looking forward to the talk. Thanks. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. You're much more generous than Scotland. I don't clap before I start. So it's great to be here. It's, it's lovely to be invited down. I flew down from Sydney this morning, and I'm here till Sunday. So it's really nice to have a look around the uni, but also to find out what people here are doing, because, as Frank said, there's a lot of kind of crossover between my own work and work that people here are doing. So, so it's really nice to find out more about your work. Um, so digital memorials. Frank very kindly gave my talk a title because I forgot to give it one. And then we were so busy talking, I didn't have time to type in the full title he gave me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about digital memorials. But what I'm going to do, because I'm a long way from home, I'm not expecting you to know anything about me or about where I come from. So I'm going to give you just a, a really, really short overview of University of Dundee, my kind of research area of what I do more broadly than just the D word, because uh, it can get a bit tiring getting called Dr. Death at parties, as I'm sure Martin knows. <laughs> do you not get called Dr. Death? <laughs> my kids introduced me as Dr. Death. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'll go into some more detail about a bespoke digital memorial. Um, that I produced a framework for with Dave Kirk from Newcastle, but we've also been actually testing out the framework by designing a, a memorial recently. So Dundee, I found out all this stuff by doing this slide. So I didn't know we were ranked first for impact in scientific research. We do a lot of cancer drug discovery work at Dundee, but also some great technology work uh, amongst other things. And we're, you know, we're good at what we do. We're in the top 100 list uh, for universities worldwide. Um, we give our students a great experience. I think that's mainly because we have a really cheap bar and a free bus home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so where's Dundee? So this is the fault line, which depending how things go in the next two hours, yeah. you're going to hear a big ripping noise yeah. or not. Uh, but Dundee's up here on the coast, so it's a lovely place to live. Um, we have great access to mountains and beaches, and it's not as cold as people think. <laughs> it's not as warm as here. You all know this is going on. This is the Yes campaign stand. There, isn't, there wasn't a No campaign stand at this event. This is where I work. This is Duncan at Jordanson College of Art and Design, which is part of the University of Dundee. It's a pretty big art college. So there's, we have this building and this one. 
um, and as is the way with art colleges, some pretty nasty concrete architecture. So, I'm going to give you just a little overview about me, but also a couple of colleagues to give you a sense of what we do at Dundee. Um, so, my research focus is very much interdisciplinary. I'm also a visiting fellow at the Centre for Death and Society at Bath, which is great. I just love telling people that because people go, what? <laughs> um, so I kind of I sit at the edges of sociology and psychology in my work, as well as being kind of situated within computing science. I'm interested in what it means to be human in a digital age. So looking at particularly at transitions across the lifespan, looking at growing up, becoming a parent, growing old, dying, um, but also about how we can use technology to give people more personal agency rather than just making it cheaper to do stuff. Um, and I'm interested about how we share information using technology so people have a sense of control over it. I'll just talk very briefly in a minute about some projects. I'm going to focus, obviously, on digital inheritance as the one most relevant today. My colleagues, I don't know if any of you know Jane Wallace. So she does some really nice work on dementia and personhood. She's a, a designer, but she designs physical artifacts with a digital element um, and recently has been working with one specific couple. She had a lovely Kai paper last year or the year before where she worked specifically with one couple where the wo woman had early onset dementia and she produced personalised digital jewellery to increase that person's sense of personhood and connection with her family. So very nice, very sensitive research and she's one of the co-founders of Research Through Design. Has anyone here submitted to Research Through Design? So it's a, it's a really nice conference. They, they were massively oversubscribed this year. They had, I think it was uh, he more heavily applied to than Kai by a long way. So it's a kind of up and coming conference. Um, John Rogers makes data physical. This is his Mars rover on Earth. So it takes data from the Mars rover on, you guessed, guessed it, Mars, but it does the same movements on Earth. So it really makes space data physical by zooming around just the way the, the other one is up there. Um, and he works with NASA, he does talks at South by Southwest, he does a lot of cool fun stuff. He's way jollier than me. Um, I do the dark stuff. Nick Taylor was the subject of me taking off on a flight so I, <laughs> so I ran out of time to put a slide in. So Nick does work on political discourse and social engagement, community empowerment. So we're working in quite different spaces, but they're all about being human in a digital age in some sense. And I also have staff working for me. I have a, an anthropologist, and I have a PhD student who's starting soon on digital separation, about what it means to break up in a, an age when a lot of your material, of you being a couple, is out there online, and it can be retagged after you break up. Um, so my work is interdisciplinary, it's grounded in HCI, although I did my PhD in a natural language generation department. So one piece of work I did, this was my PhD work a while ago, was Baby Talk Clam, which was about sharing information in sensitive contexts when parents have a baby in neonatal intensive care. So it's the kind of thing you don't put it on Facebook. If you've got a really sick baby and you're scared your baby's going to die or it's going to be disabled, you just don't put it on Facebook because it's not appropriate. So I did, uh, did work on user modelling and understanding how people share information offline and testing out how we could make it work online to reduce the communication burden when people are experiencing a crisis. And in this case, it was intensive care with babies. Um, and it was really ended up being based on a model by Robin Dunbar, the evolutionary anthropologist about emotional proximity and information sharing, so there was automatic editing of messages about how the baby was. So that's, that work's been carried on by my PhD student, Kirsten Smith, who's now working with carers who want social support. Charting the digital lifespan looks at agency over your digital footprint across the entire lifespan in a projected future where we've all got digital footprints from birth to great old age, which is not possible yet, of course. We're not that far into the internet age. So we're trying to create predictions of 
what that would be like, how people would, ha would have control of their personal data. Um, we're focusing on emerging adulthood, becoming a parent, retiring from work for that project, and I'm PI across the project, which is across five universities in the UK. So part of the aim is to raise digital literacy um, so people can get the sense of control over what's out there about them. But I'm going to focus today on a project called Digital Inheritance, which has been running for the last three years. Um, and through, I've met Joji at Bath when he visited the Centre for Death and Society and I was there. I knew about Martin's work and Martin's team kind of heard on the grapevine initially that you got the grant. Um, so Digital Inheritance looked at what happens to your data when you die. Um, so how do you bequeath personal data? How do other people inherit it? And how would they reuse it? And personal data could be anything. It could be emails, it could be photos, it could be your Air Miles account. So a big mixture of personal data that we hold. So when it comes to what a digital lifespan is, I'm always wary of problematizing it, but a digital lifespan is quite different to a physical lifespan. You know, if I, if I drop dead now, it's going to be really, really obvious. But it's a lot more difficult for me to die digitally. Even when we start physical life, birth is pretty obvious. You know, you're either in the uterus or you're out of the uterus. Digital birth is happening sooner than physical birth. So this is, you can buy this online. I don't know if any of you are expectant parents, but this is a scan of a fetus in utero and you press it and you can listen to the sonogram of the baby's heart. So it's kind of got this social presence in the world around mum or dad's neck or granny's neck. Long before it's out of the uterus, it's suddenly got this digital identity. Of course, across the lifespan, there's lots of different people using technology. They may be using the same piece of tech, but using it quite differently. It's not really an off switch the end of your digital life. It's quite difficult to stop existing digitally. Even in the states where there's paedophiles being given a lifelong ban on using technology and the internet, they're still on the internet in terms of their presence. They still have a footprint there even if they're not using tech. If I decide tomorrow I want to go offline, it's going to take me a lot to unpick my digital presence. If we head further into dystopia, there's a company called Life Nought. Some of you may have come across. This, the lady in the bottom right corner is Bina48. She's a robot model of a real live researcher called Bina. And it's claimed that Bina, the researcher's personality, has been downloaded into this rather creepy robot head. And we'll have conversations with you just as if it were the real Bina. And Life Nought is the company and this is their claim that after you've been declared legally dead, future technology may be able to grow your new body by exogenesis and your mind file may be downloaded it, enabling you to live on indefinitely. So it doesn't really work terribly well, but there's a move towards it and it's partly coming from firms in the US who are doing this cryogenic storing of bodies for the wealthy who can't bear the thought of stopping existing, I guess. So you know, it's pretty fuzzy when you stop existing digitally. So if you do die, which is somewhat inevitable, unless you're one of these wealthy Americans, you have digital assets. Tangible assets are really easy. There's lots of legislation in place. We can bequeath stuff. I can leave my jewellery, my furniture, my home to named individuals. It's supported in law in the UK and internationally. So it's nice and clear. There may be disputes over the will, but there's a legislative process for it all. It's a lot different for all the digital assets. You know, we produce all this, all this stuff, and so it's very mixed. Oops. It's, it's stored all over the place. So it may be on the cloud, it may be on your mobile phone, it may be in your house, it could be anywhere. So there's multiple locations. Some of it's valuable. 
It might be emotionally valuable. It might be that lovely touching photograph of you having a special moment with someone that you love. It might be practical. Where's the stopcock? You've got it in an email listed. You know, where's the deeds to the house? Store it in an email on your email account. It may be financial. Anyone got an air miles account? So there's, there's a financial value to your air miles, usually kept online. Intellectual property, you know, the blog that's going to become a Pulitzer Prize winning book. So there's different kinds of value embedded in data. There's also stuff that people may not want to pass on. Porn, criminal activity, negative opinions, you know, all the kind of things that people kind of hide. Internet's a good place for hiding things. It's really difficult to bequeath data. So it's difficult for lots of reasons. Um, the main one is that internet service provider terms of service are inconsistent. So Google is different to Yahoo, is different to Twitter, is different to eBay. They all vary. There are services called digital executory services. They're flawed too. One of the big reasons they're flawed is they've only been in existence less than 10 years. The early ones have already gone bust. The new ones, they may survive, they may not. I plan to live a few years yet. I don't know if the companies will last that long. Some of them have a terrestrial address. They're registered to, many don't. And what they ask is that you hand over all your passwords and account details to them. So you're handing over perhaps your online banking details and passwords to an online service. You don't know where it is. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be comfortable doing it. It's pretty ropey. Legislation varies across countries, between U.S. states. So the U.K. has different legislation to here. Even in in the U.S., we were talking at lunch. Um, Ohio has different legislation to other states about what happens to data on death. So it's a really inconsistent land landscape, which is born. Firstly, the fact that the internet is still pretty new compared to law, and lawyers don't catch on quick. They like to talk things over, they like to think about it, and it takes time to make things law. So we're still kind of in this very early days for this. Um, accounts, even if you do get access, so if you know that your loved one who's passed away has accounts, so that's you're on a winner just knowing they had the accounts. Do you know the actual account name, or is it pseudonymous, is it anonymous? Do you know the password? So there's practical problems as well. Do they, does the person even own the data? So things like Apple, iTunes. I don't know if anyone saw the spoof piece of news that Bruce Willis was taking iTunes to court. There was, it was a spoof. People in the UK got really caught on it that um, Bruce Willis was going to sue Apple because he'd spent $5,000 or something for your music from iTunes and had found out he couldn't bequeath it to his many children. So it was, it was a spoof, but it was quite good because it raised the question about license over ownership. So if people do inherit personal data, what do they do with it? And this is what I'm going to focus on particularly. People are using personal data in funerals to make them more personal. So Particularly in evangelical churches, we're seeing more personalized funerals, so use of PowerPoint, use of a playlist, something taken off someone's iPod before they passed away is played at the service. Um, young people suddenly have a role in funerals that they didn't before because older people go, I don't understand this tech, can you do it? So suddenly they have a voice in the whole process of the funeral memorial service, which is really nice. Um, people are using the personal data to maintain continuing bonds with the dead. So it might be maintaining a social networking site. A lot of people are leaving messages to the deceased on social, social network sites like Facebook. Younger people are saying very casual things. You know, I miss you. I wish you'd been out shopping with me today. You would have helped me choose the right dress. Older people are a little bit more formal. But there's this sense of carrying on a communication where people would have done it previously, perhaps at a graveside or a particular spot that was a special place, they're doing it online in the same way. Um, bearing a mobile phone with the body. 
don't cremate it, it'll blow the doors off the furnace. Best to switch it off during the funeral service. There are accounts of the phone going during the funeral service when the phone is in with the coffin. Um, creation of, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you Google on patents for um, for death now, there's actually a few apps where people can text from their coffin in case they wake up and send a, send an SMS. <laughs> but that that, oh, so that goes back to Victorian traditions. You used to be able to put a bell. There was a rope put into the coffin in case the person woke up, and there was a bell above the grave. So it's no different. It's no different. No different. <laughs> just, just battery powered. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly on creation of online memorials. So I'm not really going to touch on distress and lack of accountability. It's kind of a different area. So a bespoke digital memorial. This was carried out. I worked with Dave Kirk. On, um, we were both kind of saying, how do we even do it? How do we design a memorial in the first place? What, what, what do we do? And we thought, well, if we didn't know, it was quite likely that nobody else knew either. So we set about writing a paper to articulate it. And um, we wanted to, to map the space as much as a kind of straw man to start thinking about it rather than saying this is the definitive model. So we wanted to think about how we incorporated digital technology into memorialization practice. Um, we looked at previous work. We looked at web-based memorialization. We looked at things like reflective design uh, and also digital memorials as entertainment, which we've seen a little bit online. It's a really broad area. The reason for this picture, this is the AIDS quilt laid out in Washington, D.C. It's huge. And the reason I've got it there is because every square, so this is, this is Rock Hudson's square. But each square is different because each one is made by people. And they all want to communicate their loss in a different way. So it kind of shows the scale of how people communicate loss, even on one subject area. And each square is the person? Each square is one person who's lost their life to HIV. So it's absolutely vast. So we tried to pin it down to a framework. And I'd be really happy for comments on the framework. So we were kind of thinking, well, who creates a memorial in the first place? Who are the actors involved? Both who produces it and who's going to see it? What do you put into a memorial to make it? What should it look like, feel like, smell like? What should it say? I've used the metaphor of the poppy through these slides simply because it's such a simple design idea and yet it communicates an idea really strongly and it's lasted so long and it is a, you know, it's used as a memorial widely in Australia as well as the UK and elsewhere. So when we think about who are the actors involved in memorials, it might be an individual, it might be a number of people. It might be an institution producing a memorial. It might even be the deceased before they pass away choosing to create a memorial for themselves. If, you know, for whatever reason, it may be they're quite ego-driven or it may be there's a particular personal motivation. So they have a role in both providing a narrative to put into a memorial, but also curating it, so deciding what to include, what to leave out. Tensions can arise if you have more than one voice because, of course, then you want to navigate between these multiple voices about what the memorials are trying to say. So a good example of multiple voices is there's a memorial at, um, for 911 in New York, which actually brings together a lot of different voices, but you can listen to each one of them in the online memorial. So you can hear many different accounts of the event and of people's losses. In terms of who sees or who experiences a memorial, there's d 
a dimension of whether it's public or private, but there's also a lot of ground in between. So this is the Vietnam War Memorial. This is a serviceman who had lost particular colleagues in the Vietnam War. So although this is a very public memorial, it's in a public space, it's a huge thing. Uh, he's an individual, a private individual, going to the spot where there's the names of his fallen colleagues. But this will change over time. So as people pass away who've been bereaved, it becomes less of a personal memorial and more of just a public one with public significance, in this case as a reminder about war, however you want to interpret that. So what goes into a memorial? In this example here, the flag is for fallen Canadian soldiers on a beach in France in the Second World War. So there's quite a few layers in it. So it's a memorial to particular people, but it's also an event. It's that particular battle on that particular beach. The circumstances of a memorial also affect what it's going to be. So, for example, I guess most of you will remember the death of Princess Diana some years ago. So it affected Britain in a unique way because it was unexpected, it was premature, she was pretty young, um, it was tragic, you know, death of a princess. So it had a certain quality to it, which the death of the Queen Mother, Queen Mother who died aged about 102, was quite different because it was expected, you know, crikey, she was pretty old. It was timely, she was pretty old. It wasn't tragic, it wasn't traumatic, she'd lived a very long life. And the UK response to it, publicly and privately, was very different. So there's these different dimensions that govern the kind of response to death and the kind of memor memorial that's created. So what goes into a memorial? It might be material possessions, so it might be, I think in the UK, I don't know if it's the same here, you sometimes see roadside memorials where there's been a car crash and you'll see something that belonged to the person left at the site, you know, it might be a motorbike jacket, it was the most recent I saw, uh, so it told its own story, but it was the biker's jacket. Um, more likely it's memories. We have books of remembrance at funeral parlours, churches in the UK. And people will include their memories. Or they'll write on a gravestone, you know, beloved mother of ten children died tired. Um, material elements. So there may even be elements of the body included in the memorial. This is particularly when you think back to medieval Catholic Church and the idea of relics. That's a really good example of material elements of the body. It was always claimed to be saints' bones or Christ's a part of Christ's body, but there was a part of a body inside this memorial artifact that was taken from church to church. This example, I quite like this because I th it looks like a military cemetery, but each of these items is a memory stick with personal data on for the named individual, and their date of death, on oh, no, a date of birth is listed on there. So it's, a, it's very much a digital memorial, and it's just playing with the idea of the memory stick but it also looks like a traditional cemetery. Which takes us on to form. So I think Martin's been looking a lot at purely digital forms of memorial, haven't you? Um, so we were kind of thinking about whether something was purely digital or if it could also be a hybrid. And whether, would it stay the same? Would it change? So this example here is Michelle Gowler's digital remains, which I think it's, a, it's either Royal College of Art or Goldsmiths. But what's really nice with this is it's sensitive to location. So it only works in a certain location. But what it does is when you open it in that location, there's digital data you can access, which is memories of the deceased. So it works both as a really lovely artifact and the names inscribed on it just here of the person who passed away but it's also about that special moment that you have to make an effort and go up to a particular place which evokes memories and then the digital memories are activated as well. Mm. Who would, who would 
In that case, it was the artist. But this is, it's, a, it's an idea. Of this is yeah. These are these are. It's so early. It's ju these are all still just really provocative kind of ideas exploring the space. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone's produced one that's really used. The, the most extreme that's happening in the, this space in terms of design is about what's happening to cremated remains. And that's really creative, for better or worse, depending. You can have your ashes shot into space. You can have them tattooed on your back. Uh, there's all sorts of things. But for digital, there's not, nothing yet, or nothing you can buy. A memorial needn't be concrete. It might be performative. So this is um, two minutes silence in London on Armistice Day. So people are remembering it's a mem memorial, but it's not a concrete, tangible thing. It's a behavior. Everyone stops. Everyone stops speaking for two minutes, no matter where they are. It's the start and end of it signaled. Similarly, s memorials may stay the same or they may even be ephemeral. So this one is poppies in Trafalgar Square. They're scattered in Trafalgar Square just for Armistice Day, and they're cleaned up at the end of the day. But for that day, they serve as a fairly vivid reminder. So what should a, what should a memorial say? What's its message? Well, this one's got a clear message, lest we forget reminding people about war, reminding people that war involves loss of life. But memorials can have a variety of messages. Cultural ones can include, for example, Bachir Friedman's work in Rwanda, which are about reminding future generations about the loss and the genocide that carried out, was carried out. And that's a digital one. It's a digital archive. Um, and it can also be about allocation of guilt. This is the per you know, this is these are the people that carried out this atrocity, nine one one. Yeah. Did, did you have a question more? Oh, no, no, no. oh you just Wait, fiddling your pen. That's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Since you're using the poppy, is, what's the history or, or where did where did the poppy come from? I know that it's been it, used, but I was just wondering where it, it came, came from. from First World War in the fields of Flanders where the dead it, I mean there was kind of mud fields in France and Belgium. Um, and there were so many dead. And at the end of the war, all these poppies sprung up everywhere across the fields of the dead. And it was then adopted as a metaphor. Okay. So cultural messages have various reasons. If it's a personal message, it might be um, to affirm the life of the deceased. I'm sure you've all walked past benches saying, you know, lovely Maggie used to sit here and walk her dogs, died in 1973. So there's got a kind of a maintenance of continuing bonds, a sense of connection with the person that passed away and a, an acknowledgement of their life. It's unusual, but there's one or two memorials out there. And again, they're just examples. They're not being used actively as memorials. But Yuri did a lovely piece of work called Thanata Fenestra which played with Buddhist practice and sacred rituals. So it incorporated a digital element through digital photos with the use of shrines and lighting a candle to remember the dead. So I think it's, it's a really interesting area to look at. There's very little done in this space. So we developed this framework. But you know, a framework's kind of just a framework. It's a bit academic. And so we wanted to test it out. So I've been working recently with uh, Dave Kirk, with Elise van den Hoven, and I had a student, an EU-funded student, Miriam Julius, who did the design work. And Miriam and I worked with a bereaved parent, which it was actually surprisingly easy to recruit, uh, which surprised me. We had no luck at all, and someone who knew me and knew the kind of work I do, said, oh, you need to get in touch with so-and-so. And a parent set forward and was brilliant. So we worked with her for about three months. We did a lot of field work. We visited her home a lot of times. We went out to places where she, she'd lost a son, a teenage son. So we visited the places he used to go. We visited his school. We met his teachers. So we did a kind of ethnographic form of inquiry. 
So the actors involved, the author was the parent. She'd said that she wanted her surviving child involved. Actually, he didn't want to be involved. He was always, if we were there, he was always, always in his bedroom or he'd come down to humor mum, but he wasn't really an author, except behind the scenes. Mum wanted the artifact that we were going to design to be for her and for her surviving child. So the inputs, the subject was dictated by our participants, so it was her adolescent son. It was a tragic and untimely death. It was very unexpected. And it was really up to her what she chose to do in terms of what was the contents. We were very much governed by what she wanted. And it was brilliant. She let us see so much stuff. She had boxes out from under the bed. We saw all the photos. We saw his drawings from when he was much younger. It was quite an emotional journey. Um, but we had this huge insight into the young man's life and who he was. Um, his Facebook profile, he passed away five years ago. So he didn't have a huge Facebook profile, and it wasn't public, but uh, the mum let us see through her Facebook profile so we could actually access the material he had up there and see the photos, this kind of thing. The participant we had is very touchy-feely. It wasn't going to be a digital memorial. You know, she wasn't a digital woman. She was a huggy, kissy, you need a cup of coffee. We would, when we went there, we were always fed. So it, she's very much a, a physical kind of person. So it was a hybrid memori memorial. Um, it also, through the process, we realized that it was important to her that it evolved, that it changed, it wasn't static, that it could gather new memories because she wanted to have that ongoing connection with her son. What message should it convey? Well, of course it was personal. It was a personalized memorial, but there was also a sacred quality to it and that she wanted to have time and space to sit and think now and again. So we tried to include that in the memorial. When you first asked about the yeah. audience, um, sure. Um, the audience is for the parent and the child, but does that mean that the memorial would remain private? Or that was the intention. That it would not be accessible to others? Correct. Yeah. So it was, she didn't want it made available publicly. There were sensitivities about some of her personal relationships where it just wasn't appropriate. It wasn't going to be at all helpful. So not to other family members nope. or cousins? Or anything. There were some, some named family members, but she, she needed to have control of that. Uh, there, were, there were some very strong tensions so that were going on. To a public memorial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Although this changed. So we gathered a lot of information about the young man, what his life was like, his, you know, what colours did he like, what was important, what were the stories about him, and built up as storyboards. And also, our participant wasn't a UK, well, she hadn't been born in the UK. So we tried to bring in her cultural preferences and traditions about a memorial as well. So this is, I'll show you this now just because it's, harder to work out once I show you the full thing. But the young man used to run a lot. So part of the field work, we went on a hill walk with mum to see where he used to go running. Um, so this is the kind of the slightly abstracted landscape of the hills. And he also used to love drawing birds. So there's a lot of feathers all around the outside to, to kind of bring that into the story of the artifact. There was Arduino technology embedded into the base of it, but she's not a techie person, so we had to put that in in such a way she didn't have to deal with it. So this is the base of the artifact just here, and then this was all covered over. And it, we ended up, because of the time scale, just kind of gluing it down rather than making it something that could be opened up. So this was the artifact. It was this size, so you could hold it, so you could sit. And the idea was that it was very plain on the outside so that the gaze would be drawn inside it. So it pulled in attention inside. And what would happen when you used it? Next. Oh, that's the interior. So this is the laser cut paper that I showed earlier, put inside and colored. But she would hold it. And it was only when she held it in a particular way that it would trigger stories that people had recorded about her son. 
so the sound would come from inside the device. It would vibrate, so it's quite tactile. There's also quite a nice soft finish to it, but the story would come out of the artifact, and there were lights inside it to draw her gaze in, so it was a point of focus. So it was a, the idea was to give her a kind of point of stillness and concentration just on her son to maintain that continuing bond, which was what she was looking for. So some of the insights that we gained from doing the work was this notion, I, I don't know if you've come across it, of the post-self. So in the so social sciences literature, the post-self is the identity of an individual after they pass away. So all of us will in some way leave some kind of identity after we go. No, you, you hope that it's a favorable one. Galileo did quite well. He was vilified in life. And then after death, we go, he was so clever. Yeah. So people's identity after death may change. Um, so it's kind of impression management, but after people have gone. But we found that it was quite a complicated thing to work out what content to include. A lot of the time, certainly a lot of the material that was included actually wasn't digital. The mum took digital photographs of stuff and then recorded digital stories about it because that's what she wanted to do. It didn't really matter whether it was digital or physical, it was whether it was about the boy. Um, it was really difficult to work out what to include and what not to, and actually we found that the audience shifted Although she said she wanted an audience of herself and her surviving son, that did change and became renegotiated and grandparents wanted to see it, but she didn't want somebody else to see it. So it was quite a fluid thing. Uh, and I think even if I asked her now, you know, a month down the line, she would have changed her mind again. Ownership um, was really sensitive about who could make changes to the content of the memorial, who should have control over it. Something that came up for us as well during the process was this question of temporality. Should, should a memorial stay the same? Should it change over time? So in the gravestones on the left, it's really clear that everybody who knew those people is dead. Nobody's looking after it. No one's cleaned the moss off. They're leaning to the side. They're pretty old. There's trees growing around it. They're degrading naturally, and that's just a normal process. And councils will keep an eye out for gravestones that are doing this. And if they need space to build a flyover or something, like, ah, no one's, no one's going to miss it. You know, and, and they will build over cemeteries at certain times unless people are interested in conservation. Quite different if you've got a digital memorial. They stay pristine. They don't degrade. They don't decay unless pages go missing on the internet. I think a, an unusual example um, Jane Wallace, my colleague at Dundee, she produced a locket um, which over time would lose pixels. So the photographs would degrade according to an algorithm. So it was a really nice piece of work she did a few years back. So she'd, she's explored the idea of degradation and temporality a little bit. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 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 She's, I, I, I get really cross with her because she's not written it as a proper paper yet oh. and somebody else has since written some work about losing pixels from images and I keep saying but Jane did it first yeah. so but it, yes it's she does really thoughtful it's work such a natural process, yeah how quickly do they lose? I think she well, she was doing it she would have <coughs> been doing it as a as a prototype so I would guess she did it fast enough that people noticed right. But I mean, you could, the algorithm could be slowed down, so it was over 100 years it lost the data. It wouldn't matter. Well, there seems to be another dimension to temporality that also a feature of technology, even if they stay the same. They need some maintenance. You may have to charge them if they break. You need someone to fix it. You need to provide infrastructure yeah. for wireless. Yeah. Like yeah, so, there, so there's other elements of temporality where digital is more likely to break. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got old letters in a box, they ain't going to break. Yeah, the digital memorial we made will break. I know it will. You know, I'm dreading the call actually because the girl who did the design was an intern. I didn't do the tech, and I'm, you know, I'm going to have to fix it because the participants going to want it fixed. So yeah, it presents its own problems. 
So just to kind of sum up about digital inheritance as a topic, we're adding more and more things to our set of digital assets. They're growing, you know, research councils are funding people like us to create new ways of creating more digital stuff. And yet we've got no real mechanism for how we hand down these materials. So it's becoming a pressing problem. Systems just aren't designed for end of life. I suspect that's in part due to the fact that a lot of technology researchers are quite young and they think they're immortal. Um, that's just my, my personal view. Physical and digital lives aren't fully tied together. I don't think they ever will be because they're just different things. Much as physical and social life are distinct, someone can socially die because they're in a care home and no one visits them long before they die physically. So even our social and physical lives aren't fully synchronous. It's really hard to bequeath your data. I haven't done, I, you know, I don't have a will for my data. Um, so it's tricky. Looking at digital memorials in particular is a really wide-ranging space. So there's loads of opportunities for, for design and for new ideas and for trying things out because it's such a broad space. The, emer the framework that I've talked about today is an emergent one, so I am really happy for people. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to Joji a bit more about his memorials and getting kind of more flesh on the bones of the framework and poking it to see if it breaks, um, particularly with other cultures because different, there's different, so many different ways of dealing with death and bereavement across cultures. It's these interesting questions of temporality and the post-self The other thing is by, I hope that by producing a framework, it kind of reduces participant burdens so we're not repeatedly going out to participants just testing stuff out to see what we need to do, but we have some kind of starting point to look at how we design digital memorials for them. So this is the kind of summing up slide. So I've told you where I come from. I've told you what I do. Um, I've talked a little bit about digital inheritance and memorials, so really it's, it's over to you to ask me any questions you fancy. <laughs> Mexican wave. So, yeah. So I'll go first. Um, I'm interested in visibility, which I guess is, is like your audience dimension in, in the framework. So. Yeah. With physical memorials, we sort of all get the parameters, you know, so the village has a cemetery. Yeah. We all get roughly the same plot, but if you're more important, you might get a bigger yeah. stone. And then people control the visibility of the memorial. Yeah. You put the war memorial in, in the village green so that everyone will see it. Yeah. And, 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 that, and the war memorial is usually rather didactic in the sense that it's, it's, it's imposed upon uh -huh. the survivor. Now, I wonder how that translates to digital. So if you have a, a, a web based memorial, then in, in principle anyone can see it. But mm. I wonder whether you have to get, then get into um, search engine optimization or something to control the visibility yeah. of, of how likely people are to see the, the memorial. Yeah. Or how many yeah. Facebook friends you have you see. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. it is. It's very much down to search engine optimization. I got asked, I was at um, an EU conference, Computer Privacy and Data Protection, and Someone said to me, well, how do you know if someone's even really dead? And I said, well, I guess it's when you drop off the bottom <coughs> of the search. You know, when no one looks for you anymore, that's when you're really dead. So I guess visibility at the moment, that's the best we can offer is whether you pop up on the search. Yeah, the, the, the URL domain name is dot dead or something. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it's a funeral. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a rush out the door now to do it. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to get a lot of, uh, I think your framework is going to be really useful even in my writing up good. stage now which is really good. Uh, probably, it probably skews towards my interest more, uh, more for those public expressions. Yeah. You talked through some of those spontaneous memorials or spontaneous shrines and I think that's yeah. probably one element that I was thinking about with your talk is just how designed something is and in your yeah. Examples. Some of those are, are more emerged, non-designed in a way yeah. by someone like ourselves who's yeah. interested in design. And I think that's possibly something that might might be 
more yeah, something worth thinking about in a framework like that. But that's probably the only thing I, I thought would possibly not capture in some of those more areas. But but actually, yeah, because spontaneity is, you're mm -hmm. right, it's not captured at all. Like a Facebook page, for so example. Can I, can I get you to give oh, me a right. note of <laughs> thank you and visibility um, as Facebook, well? A Facebook page becomes a memorial for some, somebody. Yeah. But that, that's something which really emerge, emerges without a specific design. Yeah. Is it mentioned before yeah. formality or something? Or is it formal? Yeah, I'm not sure. How designed is something to water it down here? There's, there's examples offline as well. So Princess, yeah. Tony Walter's written about Princess Definitely, Diana. Yeah. And the fact it was unprecedented mm. for a member of the royal family mm. to be mourned like that. And, uh, and, uh, you know, they're pretty questions. stiff. It raises questions about what the designers were, what are we doing, yeah. and whether we're, we shouldn't be there. And how do, you, how do you design for spontaneity? I have no clue. <laughs> you know, that's a big question. So, yeah, thank you. One yeah. interesting thing is oh. um, whether they're symbolic. sound recording and things which I would find sort of overwhelming to listen to a voice of a dead person. Yeah. I, could, I couldn't listen to it. So, so, so traditionally memorials sort of shied away from that very yeah. specific representation of showing human figures and, and, yeah. and just very symbolic. There's been, there's an example of symbolic work, um, I've forgotten his surname, there's a composer, Kevin somebody, Kevin Malone. Who he's a UK academic, but a composer as well, and he was commissioned to write a piece of, of music to memorialise 911, and it wasn't the 911 Twin Towers; it was the the plane that went down where the, the passengers overwhelmed the terrorists and took the plane down, and he wrote a piece of music for that. And what he did was he went out, interviewed a lot of the people involved like the first responders and also the bereaved and then wrote a piece of music that included little tiny snippets of their voices but you couldn't tell who it was so that it was quite abstract and it was it's only been performed twice so it was commissioned specifically for the anniversary played once and then played once elsewhere and it'll never be played again so that's that kind of draws in this idea of kind of abstract Memorials and also temporality. So, were you thinking of having that kind of dimension in your framework to sort of create a form of representation? Can you come up with a sacred? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Do you think the sacred, the kind of sacred qualities and the, and the um, oh, let's, uh, hang on, let's just go back. The, the, the most flowers are most supposed to be metaphorical. So there's the kind of the, the idea of there being static and evolving and the sacred and secular. So, uh, so I don't know. I think it needs a lot of testing out, and it's it is really there as a as a straw man just to, to get a starting point. Because I think at the moment one of the problems with the space is that this can be quite tacky and unimaginative. So it's to try and push people to think beyond you know, the ghastly website with the flowers at the side and possibly an advert which works on the name of the person. So there was some poor chap called Ryan passed away and there's loads of adverts at the side for Ryanair on one <laughs> memorial website. It's very naff. So it would be nice to get beyond that. But I th yeah, I think it's an interesting point. Um, war memorials have been, the history of them has been quite controversial. You know, so, so that whenever they, like, so for example, the Shrine of Remembrance, Yeah, actually, yeah, I can. Uh, there are. I think there's a few in the UK that have been a bit questions but of also, taste. But also, I mean, the history of all memorials has really moved away from the kind of the literal, you know, the kind of um, you know, representation of soldiers laying in the ground or something like that. To much, much more abstract things, you know, right? So there is that kind of. And I think that's kind of emerging a lot of those controversies. Kind of 
Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering about the discoverability aspect of it because with the, this, sorry, this the discoverability. Discoverability, yeah. Because with Silicon Memorials, you sometimes can just stumble upon a memorial accidentally when yeah. you walk in a park or something, and uh -huh. you just learn something about the event, the people who live there. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's possible to accidentally discover a digital memorial as well? Yeah, I came across ones which they were a bit freaky and they vanished, which was um, online memorials to jihadi. So uh, uh, um, Islamic terrorists. And it vanished. I found it and I went back the next day and it was gone. Uh, and I've, okay, I was digging because I like to dig and nose around. I thought, oh, I wonder if there's anything on jihadi and I searched. But then it went, it was taken down. But that, that's quite a different thing from what I think what you're talking about. You can um, say that people do stumble on them online, particularly around uh -huh. young people. That's what we found anyway. Okay. Because, I mean, we know that because they say in the comments, oh, I just stumbled on this and then they report some emotional experience about it. But do you think that's, that's not intentionally designed in, is it? I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't know if it would be. If it's a YouTuber or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And also in particular. What's that? I mean, when, when things are in virtual worlds and games, I mean, they're kind of spaces, right? They're short. So people stumble and come on in and say, yeah. in your face. Do you think it would be desirable to, to design discoverability into a memorial? I would you want to? It would be more desirable for, not for personal memorials, but for some event drawing. Yeah. yeah. Like the purpose of. Even the shrine in Melbourne yeah. has now an educative purpose. Yeah. And therefore, discoverability would be desirable. Yeah. Now okay. That we now always meant to see yeah. that shrine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up another question. I've got a few here, but I wonder if you actually brought up just right there. Ex uh, Osama bin Laden was taken offline because someone put him down. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, over a period of time, Yeah. So, who gets access and who doesn't? Good question. I think it's, uh, with families, they've, and there's a, I mean, Martin will know far more than me, but there's plenty of examples of families discovering there are memorials online to their loved ones. And it ain't them that put them up, and they want them taken down, and they can't take the memorial down. They can't take them down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's tensions so in countries where um, gay relationships aren't recognised. So the, the next of, uh, or if gay marriage isn't legal, next of kin legally is blood kin, not the person who's in a loving relationship with the person who passed away. So, so it becomes even more yeah. obscure than if you have the data stored in, in a country that permits gay marriage but the person passed away in a country where it's not allowed. It, yeah, it gets I mean, really messy. I mean, I can put, you know, a memorial, say, for my family in various places. If I basically say, she lived a lovely life, and then say, they'll take it. But if I turn around and said, she killed 27 people on Russell, and they're basically not to do that. But imagine those can be now to do that online. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the same way as you said, the um, the physical burials will basically deteriorate and all that stuff. We're going through yeah. something here now. We're trying to figure out how to. We have a market here with with a lot of people buried underneath the car park, and we're trying to figure out what to do with that yeah. and how to basically deal with that. Yeah. Right? Now, imagine basically as technology rolls out and rolls out and rolls out, that there's seven billion of us that actually want to put our seeds online. Yeah. Oh, there's a there's a great book. It got the Costa Book Award a couple of years ago. Called P I think it's called Pure, about the cemetery in Paris Les Innocents, where it was just full. Yes. 
And then it started to leak because it was too full and it was pretty unpleasant. I, a great book. I didn't realize it was about that when I bought it. But uh, if you look at Facebook, it's, I think the projections are within the next 20 years, the dead will outnumber the living. So I don't know. I don't know what you do, yeah, but it's this. Still to Japan, and I've actually put people standing up because I have those Yeah, stories. and the but death hotels in Japan yes. are and amazing. You know, you'll be restricted to basically four online lines. Yeah. Instead of having pictures or all your own memories could, or letters or whatever. Could be. But that that draws in the temporality question yeah. and degradation. But two more questions. When yep. You sure. Oh, I'm just curious about our space. Like, so pitching the floor. This is not heavily featured here, well, but it seems like even it makes a difference where it is in Washington, this in or along the road, yeah. physical memorials and like this, I think, even with pictures and memorials, because on Facebook there's a different yeah. meaning as opposed to a digital physical artifact in a person's home or yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm on that, I think, but there's an interesting, I mean, you talked about temporality, I think the only interesting one is spatiality, so, you know, there can be sort of formalised or dedicated memorials to the sort of, the sense, the sort of historical sense and the sequestration of this, but, you know, what we're finding a lot more through our research is just how um, people are repurposing or, you know, using everyday sort of communications and media to commemorate loved ones as part of their everyday activity, so through hashtag funeral on Instagram or whatever, so the, the process and the digitisation of memorialisation, um, not just this temporality, but in the kind of spaces in which it's operate, isn't so. It, it, it seems to be less and less in the kind of dedicated, formalised kind of spaces, but it's part of every person's every activity. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. So it's it's kind of picking up on Walter's work about the sequestration of the dead, yeah. is being kind of erased <laughs> because the dead are more with us online, and people are talking to them. Yeah. So we, you know. It's becoming slightly more socially acceptable to, to talk about it and say you miss people. Yeah. Let me say thank you for an uplifting talk. I'm not <laughs> 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 thank you. I'm around for a wee while today. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, they just want to come up and ask me. I'm quite happy to chat. Uh, cemetery. Well, I like going to cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. It's just at the end of our campus. And yeah. It's now it's historical. Should be planning to build a road on top of it. Under it. Under it. There you go. <laughs>